Blow Guys is December the 2nd, 2020. Uh, we're about to do the restrictive disease uh, lecture. Yesterday we completed the obstructive lung disease. I hope you went back and looked at all of the C babe diseases, study them. Uh, you will have to know the difference between them um, as you're going forward. Um, today we're going to talk about the opposite uh, issue, right, which is restrictive lung disease. Uh, remember that obstructive lung disease, you can't get the air out, okay? Um, you can't get the air out, so yeah. And so restrictive is you can't get the air in, you can't get it in, right? So I gave you the joke of Alvi the alveoli, right? And he says, um, Alveoli says, um, what did he say to CO2? Right, or what did CO, what, what I'm sorry, what did CO2 say to alveoli or alve the alveoli? He said, you can huff and you can puff, but you'll never blow me out, right? That is the obstructive lung disease joke. Now I had one for restrictive, I forgot what it was, um, but it's about getting in. I think it was a, the big bad wolf or something, couldn't get in, okay? Uh, but that is the dynamic in your lung diseases, right? Either you can't get the air in, and you because of different reasons and you have lower volumes or you can't get the air out and you always have higher volumes because you can't get it out not only can you have it get it out but you have increased uh, hypercapnia hypercarbia all those issues with co2 and acid because you can't get that co2 out all right so i'm gonna share my screen restrictive lung diseases Restrictive diseases, okay? Uh, this little joke here, I don't know, really know why they put this one on here. This was, uh, Mr. Kerbo made this PowerPoint, so I don't know why, um, but we're gonna keep going. All right, objectives, the student will be able to uh, discuss restrictive disease states and interpret pulmonary function tests to classify patient either restrictive or obstructive disease conditions, right? But just the basics. List laboratory values for restrictive diseases, differentiate between obstructive and restrictive, and classify restrictive diseases. Now, this is the big one. Classifying them as skeletal, abdominal, neuromuscular, or pulmonary. We talked about abdominal yesterday, right? And we talked about skeletal. You know, a few. When I say, what if my back was hunched over or a sideways, or what if I was, you know, a woman was pregnant with twins, uh, those will be restrictions. Anytime the lung is restricted, right? You can't, it can't open or inflate like it normally should. That's a restriction, whether it's an actual disease or it's a skeletal condition. Either one or either way, it's a uh, restriction. It's stopping the lung from doing what it's doing, what it's supposed to do, okay? So that's a restriction. It will be a low compliance. There's low compliance there because it won't do what you want it to do, whether it's because the lung itself is diseased and it won't stretch or uh, the body or like the abdominal or the skeletal system is causing the body not to allow the lungs to stretch. All right. Restrictive diseases. Now, the classifications. Classifications are skeletal, right? Abdominal, neuromuscular, and pulmonary. Okay, you got skeletal, abdominal, neuromuscular, and pulmonary. These are the classifications of restrictive lung diseases. These are the classifications of restrictive lung diseases, okay? There are gonna be several listed in each class. So you gotta know, when I give you a disease, you gotta be able to tell me which class it comes from and how it manifests, how do we treat it, stuff like that, okay? All right. Let's look at the skeletal restrictive diseases first. Skeletal types we have is kyphosis, scoliosis, kyphoscoliosis, 
pectus excavatum and pectus carinitum. All right. Now, kyphosis is when the back is hunched over, right? That's called hunchback. Like the hunchback of Notre Dame, he's suffering from kyphosis. Okay. Scoliosis, remember that is the S. That's the S uh, shaped spine. The spine is curved like an S. Kyphoscoliosis is both when you have the shape, the, the S curve, and you hunched over. Okay. Some really, really uh, deformed people in the world. There's some really, really deformed people in the world. Okay, now you've seen them all at the grocery store. You've seen them at the nursing homes. You've seen people walking around bent over and crops to the side. They have restrictive disease, right? That's that's a restrictive restriction on their lungs. They lungs can't inflate like yours and eyes, but it's restricted. Okay, so they're gonna be suffering from those manifestations of restriction, which are the low volume, okay, and low capacities. Okay, now. Pectus excavatum. Pectus excavatum. Let me see who all is with me this morning. I think it's just a couple of people. Okay. Miss Rose and Miss Cummins. Miss um, Rose, can you tell me what you think pectus means? What is pectus? What do you think that means by the term? You with me, Miss Rose? What about you, Miss Cummings? You with me? Yeah. Is it uh something with the chest? Yeah, the chest, your pecs, right? Uh back when I was young, I could make my pecs jump, right? They call it pecs. That's the pecs, your chest muscles, your chest area, right? Um Pectus excavatum. So, Miss Rose, did you say you were here? I didn't hear you. Okay, she must have stepped away. Excavatum, uh, Miss Cummins, what do you think excavatum means? I'm not sure. Okay. So excavatum, have you ever heard of an excavator? An excavator or a bulldozer, right? A backhoe? I'm sure you've heard of them. You know, the, when they, when the little the, uh, orange machine they use is big claw on it that digs the dirt out. Oh, uh, yeah. And okay, yeah. that's, that's an that's a, a, uh, excavator, okay? It's, it's digging out the earth, right? Uh, my son, my two-year-old watches Blippi. I don't know where he comes from, but he watches Blippi and he has a song called Excavator. Hey, dirt, see you later. And so it's cute. And so we were driving down the street one day and he saw one, he said, excavator. I'm like, damn, what are you, excavator? You know, I'm thinking, you know, how you know that at two years old? And so that's where he got it from. So that sticks with me, okay? So pectus excavatum is the digging out of the chest. So now the, the bone structure of the chest is sunk in, okay? If, the, if it's like somebody punched you in the chest and your bones went in and stayed, right? That's called pectus excavatum. You can be born with pectus excavatum, which if that's your chest muscles or your thorax is pushed in or sunk in, uh, the lung is restricted, right? And then pectus, pectus carinatum is when the chest is like a pigeon, pigeon chest. It's small on the side and then it sticks out in the front, right? It's, it's deformity, right? Deformities. Those are the five skeletal restrictive diseases, all right? Now, how do they manifest? We usually look at the manifestations of restrictive diseases as their spirometry goes, right? The volumes. So anybody with a restrictive disease is going to have a decreased vital capacity, a decreased TLC, an increased work of breathing, right? Because they can't really get no air in, so they're working a little harder. 
a decrease in compliance. Restrictive equals a decreased compliance, right? And it's usually uh, not clinically significant unless combined with another disease. So you can have pectus excavatum and not be like, oh, I can't breathe, oh my God, all your life, right? It's usually not that bad. Uh, unless it's combined with another disease, right? Like if you got pneumonia or something else, then it gets it gets bad. Okay, uh, treatment need treatment if needed can be surgical correction, right? If your chest is sunk in, we can kind of uh, uh, fix the sternum where it's back out, right? Or if you have uh, kyphosis or scoliosis, they can try to sh surgically straighten your spine. All right, so let's look at a picture of that. Uh, spinal conf uh, conformations, conformations. Normal man will be standing straight up like this. Uh, your kyphosis is the hunchback. See how that back comes off of there as a, his spine bulges out like that. So his hunchback, which he will really be bent over a little bit more, right? And then lordosis. Lordosis is when the sway back appearance, where the, the lower back goes way in and butt comes way out. Now you might see some people uh, trying to portray lordosis because they think that's a sign of beauty, right? Some countries do think that's a sign of beauty when your figure goes way in like this and then butt come way out, right? The hourglass from the side. Um, so, you know, but that's still, a, that's a restrictive disease. Uh, now let's look at the back. Um, normal spine, right, uh, will be straight up and down. Scoliosis is the S shape, a lateral curvature. So like an S, just think of an S, scoliosis, right? That kind of changes everything. And then uh, kyphoscoliosis has got the uh, hunchback and the scoliosis curve, right? Elevated shoulders, and the shoulders are kind of up and hunched over. So those are the um, skeletal, some of the, some of the skeletal restrictive diseases, okay? Kyphosis, scoliosis, kyphoscoliosis. Now let's look at the pectus excavatum and pectus carinitum. Here it is right here, Ms. Cummins. This machine I was talking about, that's an excavator because it is excavating the dirt uh, from one area to another. It's digging it out, right? Digging it out. Uh, this is an older picture of a young man who has pectus excavatum. You notice that his sternum is sunk in, like, uh, like this excavator right here just dug some of his chest out, okay? So that's how you remember it, excavitum, excavitum, okay? Pectus carinitum, this right here, look at that. That is called pigeon chest. Pectus carinitum is also known as pigeon chest, right? It's kind of sunk in on the sides, but pops out right here. That looks gross, but surgically it can be corrected, okay? You're born with that, all right? You're born with that. But this is pectus, which is chest, carinitum, like a pigeon, right? Pigeon chest. Like a canary, right? Canary is a bird, right? That's where they get that word from. All right, next classification, abdominal restrictive diseases. Abdominal restrictive diseases are simply obesity, right? Uh, which can lead to hypoventilation syndrome because if somebody's heavy every time they go to sleep, they have what you call uh, uh, obesity-induced sleep apnea or uh, obesity um, hypoventilation, right? It's just uh, building up CO2 because of that, sleeping and becoming hypercapnic at night because your stomach is so heavy, especially if you're sleeping on your back, right? Now, if you sleep on your stomach, I guess you're all right but most people sleep on their back or their side, okay? Uh, I sleep on my stomach. But anyway, obesity, so that's just being big, right? It can cause a restrictive disease. It's a lot of weight on the diaphragm. A tumor, what if you have a tumor in, uh, in your chest or somewhere where it's blocking the diaphragm? Pregnancy, of course, nine months pregnant, you're gonna have some problems breathing on your back, right? Uh, Miss uh, Cummins, you, you got babies, right? Yes. When you were nine months pregnant, did you sleep on your back at all? I slept all the way, all, all, all over. <laughs> it didn't you, matter. I couldn't get comfortable in no no kind of way, so I slept all over. Okay. Well, you um, when you were on your back, then it can give you a 
a, re a restriction. But like I said, like we said, um, restrictive disease is not always clinically significant unless there's something else going on, right? Uh, you know, if you, if you, people still, big people still here, right? And they sleep all the time. So that doesn't necessarily mean they're sick. It just means that it is restricting their lung from being fully functional, okay? Uh, ascites, ascites is serous fluid in the peritoneum. Uh, where is serous fluid supposed to be? Where should serous fluid be found? You remember, Miss? I think you're the only one here, Miss uh, Cummins. So you're gonna get all the questions. You remember what serous fluid is supposed to be? I'm not sure. Okay, serous fluid. Remember, guys, it comes should be in between the pleura, between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. I was gonna say that, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> There's a, there's a small amount of fluid there to decrease the friction between the pleura, and that is called serous fluid. Well, if the serous fluid drains into the abdominal cavity, it starts to fill up, and it can look like an underground tunnel. The next picture I'm going to show you is like if you were under, in, a, in a cave with water in it. It just looked like you were, could be sitting in a boat in this water uh, in a cave. Okay, have you ever been to Cades Cove? Or have you ever been to, uh, um, what is that place in Sweetwater, Tennessee called, um, is it Love's Creek? Something like that, but it's a, it's a really deep underwater, underground cavern system. It's really nice. If you've never been there, take your family, something you can do uh, in the coronavirus season. In Sweetwater, Tennessee, guys, you can go to this place under underground. Uh, I forgot what it's called. When I find out, I'll let you know, but you uh, park and you walk down this steep, steep hill um, and I mean steps and you get down and you, you it's a beautiful underground cavern. And at the end of the trip, there's a lake down there, okay? Matter of fact, it's called something lake. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's in Sweetwater, Tennessee. And when you get down there, you get in this little boat. They have fish down there who have never seen sunlight. Okay, there's fish, there's animals underwater that have never seen sunlight because it's like a mile down under the ground. Um, not a mile, maybe like a, you know, 100 feet or 200 feet, something like that. It's really, really deep. All right, it's really, really deep. You can get in this boat and the boat has a glass bottom where you can see the fish come up to the bottom of the boat. Beautiful fish, uh, shiny fish, but they've never seen light. Uh, they have some old Indian artifacts and all that down there. So something you can do during coronavirus for you and your, ch your children. It's in Sweetwater, Tennessee. So if you just Google underground cavern of Sweetwater, Tennessee, it'll tell you what it is. I forgot what it is. It's something late, I think. But if you find out, let me know. Because I need to go. I haven't been since I was young. Uh, but this is what this next picture going to look like. That's why I said it. All right. Ascites. Okay. So how does it manifest? Abdominal restrictive diseases manifest with decreased diaphragmatic excursion, right? If you got a lot of weight on your abdominal, it's press, pressing against your diaphragm. Your diaphragm cannot uh, excurge like it's supposed to, right? You're supposed to, uh, the normal diaphragmatic excursion should be 1.5 centimeters, right? Between in normal breathing. It can go up to six to 10 centimeters during label breathing. But if your abdominal is your stomach is pressing on your diaphragm and it can't extend that 1.5 centimeters, which makes it a restriction. All right, decreased vital capacity, decreased total lung capacity, decreased compliance and an increased work of breathing. Same spirometry for all restrictive diseases, okay? Can't Mr. McCarthy, out. can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, because at first I'm talking and nobody could hear me, okay. Yeah, I wonder why I thought you stepped away. All right. You got something you needed to ask me? No, I was just making sure you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I got you. All right. So here comes a picture of abdominal restrictive diseases. Okay. So abdominal, first one is the obes obesity, also known as Pickwickian syndrome. Okay. 
Pickwickium syndrome is when you have a very large belly, all right? It comes from the Charles Dickens novel, The Pickwick Papers. You don't have to know that part. Just know that abdominal uh, uh, restrictive diseases, uh, obesity is one of them, right? It places a major strain on the heart and the lungs. Sleep apnea is very common with obesity. This guy here is on a sleep CPAP machine. This is a CPAP machine, which will push positive pressure into his system, okay, while he's asleep. Uh, whenever we have a patient who can't breathe, we need to add positive pressure, right? If deep breaths won't work, we may have to force some air in. So this is one way to do it. Uh, even when they're awake, we can use positive pressure this way. Uh, tomorrow, we will be talking about hyperinflation. This right here will hyperinflate his lungs for him since he can't do it himself because his stomach is so heavy, all right? So obesity is the first abdominal restrictive disease. All right, tumors. Look at this. I'm sure everybody, before internet was really popping, this was out. When it first really started coming out, this was the guy here who was uh, had a large abdominal tumor. Now he's on a lot of different pictures that we've seen. Uh, this abdominal tumor is probably too big to even be removed. He's in a third world country, so it's not like he had a chance to get rid of it a long time ago. Uh, but this here, look at this right here. This is his other knee, right? This is his other knee and his leg is kind of turned down this way. But this is huge. Can you imagine trying to breathe with this on you, right? Uh, you want to, it like it's about to pop. But this is an abdominal tumor, guys. This is an abdominal tumor. Look at this. This is a tumor. This can cause your lungs or your diaphragm not to be able to move as well, okay? This might cause your, your uh, abdominal or your diaphragm not to excurse. So now if the abdominal, if your, I'm sorry, your, your diaphragm cannot do what it's supposed to do, it cannot make the lungs inflate. Therefore, that's considered a restriction, okay? Restrict them. Again, guys, doesn't necessarily have to be disease state. The lungs itself don't have to be a diseased lung. The lung could be fine, but if it can't expand, it's a restriction, okay? It's like if you're standing in front of the door and somebody trying to get in, they could be perfectly healthy, but you ain't letting them in. So if you don't let them in, that's a restriction. You're restricting them from coming in, period. Nothing got to be wrong with them at all, all right? It's you that's holding them up and you causing the restriction, okay? So don't always think that uh, restrictive diseases have to be uh, disease like obstructive. Obstructive lung diseases are all diseases, right? Uh, the C babe disease is called obstruction. That's the only thing can cause an obstruction is the is the lung itself being actually diseased. But therefore, but in uh, restrictive cases, it could be the lungs, right? Because there are some diseases that cause the lungs to be tight or not able to do what they're supposed to do. But there's also reasons like skeletal or, or abdominal that uh, the lungs can be perfectly healthy and they are still being impeded, okay? Their uh, expansion is being impeded. So, but they're still all the same called restrictive. All right. This is another, I guess this is supposed to be another tumor. This is just like he got a little pot belly or something, but I don't know. All right, so this is another abdominal tumor. And then pregnancy, look at this. Now this don't look like regular pregnancy to me. This looks like uh, twins or triplets. Miss Rose, is this regular? Well, that's how I look when I get ready to deliver. <laughs> one? Yes, well one, huge. Your babies must be big. They never be big. They be like what? Seven, three. Well, pregnancy or advanced pregnancy is another abdominal uh, restrictive disease, okay? Pregnancy, late pregnancy, it's it's huge. It's, it's a lot of strain. If this patient, this lady is laying on her back, it's gonna be an issue with her breathing. Even if she's laying on her stomach, you know, or not her stomach, her side, still a lot of space in there, that diaphragm, which is right here. The diaphragm is right up under the breast, right? It's right up under you. It's not down here nowhere. The diaphragm rides like this, goes up and over, right up under the lungs, right? And so all of this is pressing against her diaphragm. 
So that can cause a restriction or impede the lungs from doing what they're supposed to do. So therefore, it's a, also a restriction. Okay, and then, oh, this is just a little joke here. She's got a baby. He said his is because of ice cream. All right. Here goes the underground cavern. Every time I see this, it's what it reminds me of. That, uh, whatever lake that was, Sweetwater Lake or something like that. Uh, it's like a, like a boat could just be traveling through here like an underground cave to me. But this is ascites. This is serous fluid that has drained down into the abdominal cavity. Serous fluid, we said, should only be in the lungs between the two pleura. Between the uh, visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, there's a small amount of fluid called serous fluid. But uh, in different disease cases now, uh, like ascites, serous fluid leaks down into the abdominal cavity and starts to collect over time. It has no way to get out, so that's why your stomach starts getting huge. This stomach here is because of serous fluid. This is a big ball of this green stuff right here. If you were to stab this person in his stomach or something, it would pour out this juice, okay? And so this is dangerous. It's so bad for him, he can't even zip his pants, right? He has to wear suspenders to keep his pants up. I'm pretty sure it's a he. Might be a she, but I think it's a he. Uh, and so this is how we do it. We do a thoracentesis, right? Or paracentesis, I think it's not, because thoracentesis will be draining from the lung or thorax. And paracentesis is when you do it from the peritoneal cavity, right? So a paracentesis is how, is a, this is what this process is right here. They put a, a needle in here, poke into uh, the cavity, and then uh, hook it up to a tube into your syringe and start draining that stuff out. Uh, if it's a whole, whole lot, they will connect this to a bag and let it collect into a bag, okay? But uh, it comes, it, 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 it will come again if you don't fix the problem. But once this is pushing against your diaphragm, it's a restriction. It's considered a restriction, all right? Now, fluid in the peritoneal cavity caused by reduced venous return due to heart disease, venous flow obstructions, lymphatic flow obstruction, sodium retention, or cirrhosis of the liver would increase resistance to blood flow through the liver, okay? So uh, if you have decreased venous return, right? We said that's a right-sided heart issue, right? That's a pulmonary uh, issue, all right? Uh, which is restrictive diseases and uh, obstructive diseases are pulmonary issues, right? It's the lungs either getting air in or can't get the air out. Now, like we said, restrictive have different categories and this abdominal ascites is caused due to uh, reduced venous return. And so that reduced venous return starts to uh, let the serous fluid leak into the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity where it should be. And I don't know why, you don't have to know why, but just know that uh, heart disease, venous flow obstruction, lymphatic flow obstruction, sodium retention, and cirrhosis of the liver can cause ascites. And ascites will put a restriction on the lungs, okay? Especially if it gets this big. All right. All right, next category, neuromuscular. Neuromuscular, okay, now we're getting a little bit deeper. Now we're getting into some illnesses, all right? Now we're gonna get into some actual illnesses. Skeletal is deformities by birth. Uh, abdominal could be because you either ate too much or you got pregnant, right? Or you, um, or you might've had a tumor or ascites, but neuromuscular is when we're getting into show enough sickness, okay? This is what the ones you uh, can get tricky. These first two can get tricky. I'm gonna try to give you a trick to learn them, but they can be a bit tricky, all right? Neuromu mouth is dry. Neuromuscular restrictive diseases. Myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is the first one. Guillain-Barre syndrome is the second one. Paralysis is easy if you've got to have a car wreck and get your spinal cord cut. That's paralysis. Polio. So you've heard of that. Maybe your grandmama, yeah, your grandmama probably got the polio vaccination, or maybe even your mother. And tetanus. 
All right, so myasthenia gravis, guillain barre paralysis, polio, and tetanus are the neuromuscular restrictive diseases. How do they manifest? Now, these manifest as poor inspiratory muscle function. All right, for some reason, the inspiratory muscles just ain't working because something's going on in the brain, okay? Rapid, shallow breathing with low vital capacities. Uh, Microatelectasis, that's the atelectasis, the small pockets of atelectasis all through the lungs. VQ mismatches can start happening, right? Because you don't have the ventilation, right? You got the blood, but you don't have the ventilation. So that's a VQ mismatch on the, uh, what side? You have no ventilation, but blood, which one is that? Dead space or shunt, Ms. Rose? Don't have the ventilation, but you got the blood perfusion, but you don't have ventilation. What is that? Shunt, good, that's a shunt. So shunts start to happen with, with the uh, neuromuscular diseases, right? And hypoxemia, okay, hypoxemia, because there's no ventilation there for that blood to pick up the oxygen, all right? So minus the gravis, guys, and Gillian barre are the two, they do the same thing, almost the same type of manifestations, but they work opposite ends, all right? Now, let's look at it. Myasthenia, uh, myasthenia gravis is uh, my brain to the ground, mind to ground. Say mind to ground, Miss Ro Rose. Mind to ground. Mind to ground. M to G. 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 Myasthenia gravis is descending paralysis starting at the head and ending up at the ground. Okay, so what happens is with monostenia gravis is you start to have paralysis up here, maybe droopy eyelids, droopy lips, right? And you're like, what's going on with him? As it keeps on going, when it gets down to the lungs, you start having issues with breathing. The paralysis takes over the, the lungs. Now you can't breathe anymore, right? And then it goes on down to your intestinal system starts to, then your legs get heavy and, and can't walk, right? And then get to your feet and then eventually it'll go on out away from you you come back from it. you don't usually die from monastery gravis but it can suck okay and you will have to be in the hospital with it all right because we're gonna have to breathe for you respiratory is gonna have to intubate you and breathe for you until the paralysis leaves starts from the head and kind of just like getting wet somebody pour some water on your head and here it is down Keep going, keep going till it gets to the end. And as it goes to the end, it starts to dry up here, right? It's kind of just a wave of paralysis, right? And as it goes on out of you, it's gone. Right? And you get your function back. All right, that's monasthenia gravis. All right. Uh, like I said, you start with droopy eyelids. Then you have difficulty swallowing and speaking. Then you have respiratory dif uh, difficulty. Uh, and it says the manifestations of it are decreased vital capacity in TLC, just like any other restrictive disease. The spirometries are the same, okay? Decreased inspiratory capacity, tidal volumes, all the stuff is down with restrictive diseases, all right? All right, respiratory hypoventilation or acidemia, of course, because you can't breathe. You start to build up CO2. All right, what are the causes and effects? Now, what are the causes? I'm gonna change some of these colors. Oh, he didn't separate them good. All right, causes and effects of monasthenia gravis. What causes it? What causes it? Well, the major cause of monasthenia gravis is a decrease in acetylcholine transfer. A decrease in acetylcholine transfer. So that means uh, acetylcholine, right? is not being transferred like it should. It's decreasing. If it's cut off or decreased for a reason or enough, it can cause monasthenia gravis. Start, you, you start to have paralysis starting at the head and going down to the feet, all right? Now, this is the question I ask every group, uh, Ms. Rose. If I know that my patient is suffering from monasthenia gravis, what medicine that I may be given that I want to make sure I stop or don't give it? 
tell me the medicine that I, as a respiratory therapist, might, might already be giving this patient. Uh, and if I'm not giving it to them, I need to make sure I don't give it to them if they're suffering from monasthenia gravis. Think about it. Think about what causes it and think about your meds. You still with me? I can't hear you. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. What causes monastenia gravis? Um, decrease acetylcholine. Okay. So what might I be giving that might add to that problem? What might you be given as a respiratory therapist that what might add to that problem? The problem is a low acetylcholine, right? So what as a respiratory therapist might you be giving him that might be adding to that problem? What medicine do you give that blocks acetylcholine? Same things? No. What medicines block acetylcholine? Remember, acetylcholine is on the parasympathetic side. The parasympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter, causes bronchioconstriction, right? And so we want to have a drug that blocks acetylcholine, which is an anticholinergic. What drug do you give that as respiratory that's an anticholinergic? The one that we usually give with our butyrol together. Huh? Tell me the two anticholinergic drugs that you learned. Atropine and atropine. Yeah, atropine and, and what? Atropine and atropine. Atropine. So if I'm giving them atropine. Yes. If I'm giving the patient, so if I'm giving the patient atrovent, I might be adding to the decrease in acetylcholine transfer, right? Yes. Yeah, there you go. So that's those are the kind of things you have to catch as a respiratory therapist. Say, well, okay, if the doctor say he has minus and gravis and you notice that this patient is getting uh duonel, which is atrovent and, and albuterol, you might want to say, Hold oh, a doc. Can we switch to just pure alb albuterol or can we go to Zopinex or something because this patient uh, is already suffering from a decrease in acetylcholine and I'm giving him atrovent, which is blocking acetylcholine as well. So that's just adding to the problem. And so Dr. goes, oh yeah, good catch, Ms. Rose. Yeah, sure can, just switch to albuterol, thank you. And you have helped that patient because if we're giving a patient atrovent He's going to be in his monasthenia gravis for a long time. As long as you're giving it around the clock, then we're having a problem, right? But he's never going to, he's never going to get the acetylcholine that he needs because you're blocking it, all right? You are blocking it with an anticholinergic. You got it? Yes. All right. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, weakness decreased with repetition of muscular contraction, right? Getting they get weak. Uh, and patient may have acute cholinergic crisis. They're in a cholinergic crisis because they're not getting enough acetylcholine. And so please, if they are, don't give them an anticholinergic. 
because you are making the problem worse. So myasthenia gravis is descending paralysis from the mind to the ground, right? It's caused by a decrease in acetylcholine transfer. Right? How do we treat myasthenia gravis? Right? We treat it with drugs that prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine. So drugs that prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine is what we're going to have to give them. So we can't give them drugs that prevent the breakdown and a drug that's blocking it at the same time. We're not getting anywhere. Okay? That's, this is medicine. You have to know what medicines are doing, even if they're not respiratory meds, right? You know, if, if it's not a respiratory issue, you still got to know that maybe what you're doing may be making the problem worse. Okay? You're going to have to put them on the ventilator. Right, put them on continuous ventilator or support until it gets right. Monitor their vital capacity, tidal volumes for deterioration, as well as the ABGs. So if I'm monitoring their tidal volumes, if I'm looking at the tidal volumes are getting lower and lower and lower, that means it's getting worse and worse, right? It's that they're deteriorating. It's a decreasing paralysis, right? Uh, and I'm gonna look at the ABGs. If they CO2 start going up and up and up, that means they're not ventilating well, that means the monasthenia gravis is getting worse, okay? We're gonna have to put them on a vent. Now it says with impending ventilatory failure, you commit them to controlled mechanical ventilation, all right? So that's what we're gonna have to do. You know, we start out by watching them, get an ABG on them, do a little spirometry to see if their volumes are dropping, they're getting weaker. You tell them to suck in real hard on a NIF monitor to see if they, can they do it. If that's getting weaker and weaker, we're going to go ahead and intubate you before you stop breathing and then it's an emergency situation okay go ahead and intubate them breathe for them until the problem passes anybody can get minor center gravis anybody okay so it's not not something that's only for a certain group of people or preconditions or nothing like that this is the neuron here that we talk about the neuron right and this is the tissue right uh the person nervous system, the neuron uses acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. So this is acetylcholine going from the neuron to the muscle. Like I tried to show you with my hand and my arm uh, during that lecture, but this is it right here. This, these little particles going back and forth is acetylcholine. And when acetylcholine touches the muscles or is contact with the body, you know what happens with acetylcholine. You have constriction of the pupils, heart rate goes down, right? Um, feet or breathe, you're kind of relaxing, um, eyelids constrict, all that kind of stuff happens. I mean, pupils constrict, bronchioles constrict, all those things happen with acetylcholine. But if you don't have any acetylcholine, you could possibly develop myasthenia gravis. Okay? All right. The next one, Gillian Barre. Gillian Barre. Okay? So say, uh, Ms. Rose say ground brain, ground brain. Brain, brain. brain. All right. So uh, Guillain Barre is is ascending paralysis. Starts with your feet and ends up in your head. All right. So same type of stuff happening, but it's in reverse. Myasthenia gravis is paralysis going from the head to the feet. And Guillain Barre is paralysis going from the feet to the brain. Okay? Brown brain. All right. Now, in this case, the Guillain Barre case, the neuron, here's the neuron again, but this time uh, our spinal or neurons, the, the nerve, is protected by something called myelin. The myelin sheath. Okay? The myelin sheath is this uh, brown substance right here that protects the neuron or protects the nerve, okay? A normal nerve will have a nice, good-looking nerve, and the myelin is good and protective, all right? In Guillain barre uh, the myelin is damaged, okay? The myelin becomes damaged, exposing the nerve, okay? When that happens, you have all kind of misfires and stuff is crazy going on because the nerve is exposed. It's kind of like if you have your uh, computer right now, it's plugged up to the wall and the other end is plugged up into your computer. Well, the actual cord of the computer is plastic, right? That plasticky, rubbery substance is protecting the power, 
right? The nerves of the actual power. If you were to take a knife and cut the rubber part or the plastic part off your plug, you're going to expose that wire, right? And if you touch it, it's going to shock you, all right? Or you lose connection to your computer, right? So now if I shave the protection off of the cord, right, and then have you uh, uh, connect to your computer, you may lose power, you might not. Everybody's seen those chargers. Everybody has a, a, a phone charger that you got to hold it a certain way for it to charge. You know how you put it in there, but it don't charge. You have to wrap it around the phone or turn the phone upside down or make the cord, the, the end of the cord bend where you can make it work. You know what I'm talking about. That's uh, because the, the actual cord itself has been damaged, right? And that fiber is exposed. And so that's causing it to have uh, issues. Okay, that's causing it to have issues. Same thing with your brain. Same thing with your brain. If this myelin is uh, damaged, then the fiber is exposed, okay? Now, what causes that myelin to become damaged? Well, let's look at it. Guillain barre and we're going to stop, take a break after this one, is ascending paralysis, ground to brain, ground to brain, ground to brain, okay? Somebody's going to miss this on the test. I, I promise you, they do every time. Uh, initially, you have leg weakness, difficulty walking. You walk around like, damn, I'm tripping on stuff and can't really walk and feel I'm feeling weak. My legs feel heavy, right? And then after that, you might have some vent ventilatory muscles start getting a little weak, or you may even pee on yourself or use the bathroom on yourself or can't get to the bathroom quick enough because you don't have the strength to hold it, right? You start losing that strength. Uh, you start breathing a little bit deeper. I mean, you know, it's, it's weaker. And now I can't, I feel like I can't breathe. You know, it's, that is ascending. It's going on up, right? Then, of course, your eyelids and droopy talk, speech and stuff like that starts happening. That's Gillian Barre. All right? Now, what causes the Gillian Barre? Well, autoantibodies cause the demyelation of the nerve. Okay? Autoantibodies. These are antibodies that start attacking yourself, like autoimmune system stuff. Well, autoantibodies will start attacking and eating away at the myelin. Like, what's wrong? Why are you doing that? It's a, it's a dysfunction. And they start eating away or causing demyelation of the nerve. That means making the nerve exposed, okay? That renders that nerve unable to carry impulses to the muscles. It can't send a message if it's not coded. All right, you got that, Ms. Rose? Okay. That if that nerve is exposed and is exposed to the elements, it can't send a signal like it used to. And that signal to breathe, that signal down the phrenic nerve, how the phrenic nerve sends signal from the brain to the diaphragm to breathe, those nerves, that nerve, all other kind of nerves start to become demyelated. And now that signal is having a problem uh, going from the brain to the diaphragm, which causes you not be able to what? Breathe. Okay. All right. Now, it says usually two weeks after an upper respiratory infection. So Guillain-Barre usually happens about two weeks after an upper respiratory infection. So let's say you got a runny nose and a headache and a little fever and cough, and you're like, damn, my doctor can tell you, oh, it's just a little upper respiratory infection. You give you a little bit of uh, antibiotic or a steroid pack or something, and you're good. Well, two weeks later, your feet start feeling heavy. Your legs start feeling heavy. Well, what's wrong with me? Then, of course, you know, can't hold your pee good. Then you start having issues breathing, right? Um, that's Guillain Barre. You need to get on to the hospital because that's probably what that is, all right? Uh, it can also be caused by a foodborne infection called uh, Camphilo Camphilobacter gingunji. I I, I'm sure I said that wrong, but you know what I mean. Say this word for me, Miss Rose, right here. Um, Camp Philo Bather G. Juni. There you go. That sounds good to me. That's a foodborne infection. So food poisoning, right? A certain type of food poison found in shellfish, milk, and poultry. All right. So it don't have to be a respiratory infection. You might have ate something or drunk a milkshake or ate some shrimp at Juicy Crab or something like that. Uh, poultry as chicken, you know, turkey stuff like that. And it's, it's particular, if you catch this Campylobacter jejunji, it's possible you could get Guillain-Barre. 
that infection starts to eat away at the myelin, okay? Eating away at the myelin. Approximately one in every thousand cases of campylobacter campylobacter campylobacteriosis cases lead to Guillain-Barre syndrome. One in every thousand, okay? So just because you get this don't mean you're going to get Guillain-Barre, but it's a high chance. One in 1,000, that's a pretty good, pretty good odds that you get it. It ain't one in a million, it's one in a thousand, okay? All right, it's responsible for 30 to 40% of all GBS cases. Uh, now, how does it manifest? Of course, the same as everything else that's restrictive, a decrease in vital capacity and a decrease in tidal volume, right? And all the other ones. And respiratory acidemia, of course, okay? So Guillain-Barre is neuromuscular restrictive disease that starts paralysis starting from the ground to the brain and it causes it can be caused by a foodborne infection called campylo, camp, campylobacter jejunzi or it could happen after a respiratory infection okay that's guillain barre neuromuscular okay all right how do we treat guillain barre Treatment of Guillain-Barre is the vent. You gotta put them on a vent and keep them on a ventilator until their respiratory function returns. You gotta help mobilize those secretions by hydration using the ultrasonic nebulizer, small volume nebulizer, IPPB, which is you'll learn tomorrow, and CPT, right? You gotta make sure you get that stuff out of them. They already have that infection, so you wanna keep them clean so that they don't develop a new infection in the lungs. And then immunoglobulin immunoglobulin attaches to the autoantibodies and prevent them from killing the nerve, right? So we said that autoantibodies will go to the myelin and start eating it away. It's called demyelation, right? Removing the myelin from the nerve. Well, we can give you IV immunoglobulin, which will attach to those autoantibodies and prevent uh, the demyelation of the nerve. Once we know that's what it is, right? We gotta know what it is first and then that give you an IV of immunoglobulin, all right? And then finally, plasmophoresis. Plasmophoresis. That is just like, it's kind of like dialysis, right? All the blood is removed from the body. The cellular components are preserved and the patient receives antibodies, proteins, and immune complexes back. So they take the blood out of the body and they keep the cellular components there and they add antibodies, proteins, and immune complexes and then flush the blood right back into you. That kind of gets rid of all of the, the uh, uh, issue, right? Those autoantibodies, they just get rid of all of them and put you some new blood back in you. They can either do that or can they just give you some IV immunoglobulin, all right? And that's what this machine is right here. Plasmophoresis, that's what this patient is getting. It's IV, uh, goes, all her blood is coming out of her, going through all these little systems and it's cleaning the blood and it's giving uh, antibodies and proteins and, and immune complexes back. That's why it's important to give blood because this, this is not made up blood, this is somebody else's blood that she's getting those antibodies and proteins from, okay? Uh, and then push it back into her body to heal her, all right? So that is the Guillain-Barre neuromuscular restrictive disease, all right? It is now uh, 9.05, let's take a break to 9.15. We're gonna take a 10 minute break here to 9.15. All right, 9.15, I'm gonna pause the recording. We will come back at 9.15. All right, guys, pick right back up where we left off. All right, restrictive diseases continue with the neuromuscular classification. Last one is spinal cord injury. This was pretty self-explanatory. And it really depends on guys where the injury happened. All right. Um, the level of the injury kind of happens wherever you spinal cord is severed. All right. So injuries that are above C4 give you paralysis, 
of respiratory muscles and all four extremities. That's called quadriplegia. So remember, when we count the C, that's the cervical spine. One, two, three, four. So anything that breaks up in here, you paralyze from the neck down, okay? The higher the injury, the greater the loss of function, okay? Uh, you can also have temperature, um, temperature regulation problems decrease oh, below the level of the injury. So even the temperature is not right. It's all it's either be really, really hot or you can be really, really cold, okay? Now, this is a, li a bit more um, detailed here. C4 injuries, like we said, quadriplegia. If it goes from C6, you have you can still have quadriplegia, right? Maybe have a little bit more of your feeling around your shoulders, okay? But now T6 is thoracic. Don't forget you have your cervical spine, your thoracic spine, and your lumbar spine, right? Uh, so the neck is the cervical, the back is the upper back is the thoracic and the lower back is your lumbar. So if you break or have a car wreck or injury anywhere in the thoracic area, like say T6, if you had something around the T6 area, you can have paraplegia, which will be um, not quad, but paraplegia. So you have your arm use, but you don't have use of your legs, right? And you could possibly have a little bit of respiratory issue because look, it's right around the diaphragm area. And then if you get broke way at the bottom, like the lumbar, uh, you'll have paralyzed from the waist down, okay? So you'll have all of your breathing function and all of that, arm, head, neck, but you can't move your legs, okay? And so that's the spinal cord injury. The reason why it's restrictive is if I get an injury that I no longer have a signal to my lungs or it's really, really weak, to breathe, then that's a restriction. I can't get the air in myself because of this injury. So that's why it's still considered a restrictive disease, okay, or restrictive issue, all right? It's restrictive. If the lungs won't do what you want them to do. They're perfectly healthy, but because of your spinal cord injury, I'm no longer able to breathe, okay? So that is the spinal cord, I mean, the neuromuscular restrictive diseases, okay? Now, this is kind of like how we deal with them. You have the inability to move secretions, uh, no valsalva, that's kind of like a gag reflex. Your gag reflex is kind of like your valsalva maneuver, right? So if you stick your finger down your throat, you have a gag reflex, right? Well, a lot of people who have spinal cord injuries do not have a valsalva, right? They don't have a gag reflex. So, and the gag reflex is there to protect your airway, right? So if something's in your mouth and it's going down deep and you start gagging, that's the body trying to push it back this way. It's, hey, you're going the wrong way, okay? Uh, so if you swallow something or drink something and they go down the wrong pipe, you start gagging and coughing because your body's trying to protect the airway. So if I don't have that valsalva, now I can't protect my what? My airway. So secretions and food particles and all kinds of stuff can go right into my lungs and I won't even know it because I can't feel it. Right, I have no way of protecting myself, okay? So for that person, we're gonna to have to do the cough assist. There's a little machine called the cough assist, right? And bronchial hygiene. You gotta suction them out, CPT, make sure we keep those lungs clean. See this young man here must be paralyzed from the waist down. He has a cough assist on, right? When he needs to do whatever, it, it would force air in and then suck it right back out. Cough assist will force a little bit of air in and then suck it right back out to uh, mimic a cough, right? And so it looks like you, it makes you feel like you're coughing, okay? All right. The last neuromuscular, I thought that was the last, the last neuromuscular is polio. Polio was a virus that uh, is a neuromuscular virus, right? It's a virus that hit uh, America and the world sometime back, and it causes uh, deformity of the body. Look at this, these people here uh, suffering from polio, right? Their, their legs are just almost bent over like an animal, right? You can no longer can stand up. This person can no longer stand up straight because of the polio has ravaged his system, right? And then over here, you have babies who want to be just like this, but they had this type of science, right? In a developed country, 
they had this kind of treatment. They didn't have this back there on this in this part of the world, right? And so your body was just forced to contort to whatever the polio was doing to you, okay? But for these babies, they, that's why they have them strapped down flat so that their bodies don't start bending like that. This is kind of how they treat it. Keep your shoulders pent down, your knees and your waist pent down, and your uh, ankles pent down. And that will be a certain amount of treatment for, I don't know how long they did that, but that was the treatment uh, for polio before the vaccine came out. <laughs> polio is really like, uh, the way it ravages the body is just like coronavirus. And back then, these folks did not have a, a cure, right? There was no vaccine for it. And so you had plenty of people dying and suffering from polio, okay? Polio. And because of its uh, detorting and contorting of the body, it's restricting the lungs from doing what the lungs need to do. So that's why it's considered a restrictive disease, okay? Polio is a contagious viral illness that is most severe from, uh, from the most severe form causes paralysis, difficulty breathing, and sometimes death. Today, polio virus continues to affect children and adults in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, and some African countries. How do you get polio? Well, when a polio, a person is infected with the polio virus, the virus resides in the intestine, okay? In the intestine. It's in the nose and the throat. So transmission most often occurs through contact with stool, right, of this infected person. So somebody who has, it's known as fecal oral transmission. So if somebody is, has polio that um, goes to the bathroom, don't wash your hands, right, then you go back to the restaurant where the, um, the peanuts, it's like the peanut container or the candy dish at work, and you have somebody who comes and just reach in your candy dish and grab some candy, some M&Ms or whatever, peanuts, or you know how you have those little dishes out for the game, right? Well, if they went to the bathroom and have polio and they didn't wash their hands, then that feces is on their hands. And when they put their hands in the chip bowl or the M&M um, um, bowl or whatever, you have the feces in the M&Ms, right? And somebody else who grabs some, eats it, gets it in their mouth. That is how you contract the polio virus, okay? That's how you contract it. Uh, less frequently, transmission can occur through contact with infected respiratory secretions or saliva, which is oral to oral transmission. So deep tongue kissing somebody that has polio, uh, it's possible for you to get it, okay? Uh, back, you know, when it was affecting people. But now there's a vaccine came out. Finally, um, uh, a revolutionary vaccine came out for polio and everybody got it and that kind of eradicated it until this, until this day, okay? Same thing we hope to do with uh, coronavirus. All right, manifestation, of course, is respiratory paralysis or weakness. The sickness, it becomes so much, uh, so bad on the patient that it's either gonna affect their body where they can't get the air in, or it's gonna cause some type of paralysis and weakness where they can't take a good breath, okay? All right. Polio continue following polio transmission, a, a person doesn't immediately become sick. Once the polio virus enters the body, it travels to the back of the throat, nose, and the intestines where it begins to multiply and travel to other parts of the body. Not after seven to 14 days, symptoms of the polio begin, just like coronavirus. You can catch coronavirus and not know, have any symptoms, if you have them at all, until 14 days. Imagine the people you come in contact with in 14 days that you wouldn't have if you knew you were sick, right? That's why coronavirus is so much more deadly than, than the flu because of the incubation period. If you get the flu, you won't know it in the first two or three days of you got it from somebody. Two or three days later, you're sick, fever, you're gonna stay away from people because you already know you're sick. Well, with the coronavirus or with polio, you get it from somebody and then you don't feel any symptoms until 14 days, up to 14 days. That's two weeks that you done went to school, went to work, went to this, went to that, talk to people, you feeling fine. And then all of a sudden you come down with the uh, weakness and paralysis and stuff like that. Well, you've infected several people in that time frame, And that's why coronavirus is so much of a big spread because people don't know that they're sick and they're giving it to other people. And that's why they tell you wear a mask. 
so that you don't give it to nobody, even if you don't feel sick, okay? So this period between the polio transmission and the beginning of the symptoms is called the incubation period. It's a 14-day incubation period. That makes, the, that makes any disease more deadly, okay? Because you want to come into contact with way more people. How do we treat it? We treated it with control, mechanical ventilation, and bronchial hygiene. But the way we treat polio was with a negative pressure ventilator and not a positive pressure ventilator. Okay, we're gonna learn the difference between that uh, when we start talking about hyperinflation. All right, the next, um, the next one is tetanus, tetanus. Tetanus is a neuromuscular disease, right? That is constant contraction of the muscles. Constant contraction of the muscles, chest expansion, decrease, of course, tidal volume, vital capacity, TLC, all the same spirometry results, right? But look at this baby right here. This baby is completely contracted. Somebody's holding his hands, somebody's holding his I mean, feet, and somebody's holding his head. The baby is not sagging in the middle because his body is hard, solid. This old man right here is solid. He's alive, but his body is, con every muscle in your body is contracting at the same time. Like this baby up here, all of his little body muscles are contracting. He's pushed out and just rigid like a brick. Okay, that's called tetanus. That is a restrictive disease because if your body is locked down and the lungs can't really do what they're trying to do because you're so, you're like a solid rock, right? The body turns into a brick. So how we treat them, we have to paralyze them. We have to give them medicine that will relax all muscles, totally paralyze them, and then mechanically ventilate them. Because if you totally paralyze somebody, they can't breathe. So you have, to, you have to ventilate them as well. So sedation, paralyzation, and ventilation, okay? Uh, we give them the iron lung or chest curad. That is what we do. That's called the negative pressure ventilator. It's called the iron lung. Negative pressure ventilator is called the iron lung, okay? Also known as a chest caress, all right? That's tetanus, all right? Okay, now we're getting into the pulmonary disorders. We're still talking about restric restrictive. Remember we say we have skeletal, abdominal, neuromuscular, and pulmonary. Now we're in the pulmonary disorder classification of restrictive disease. You have pulmonary edema, you have ARDS, you have interstitial lung disease and pneumonia. Pulmonary edema, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is ARDS, interstitial lung disease, which is ILD, and pneumonia. Those are the four pulmonary restrictive disease orders, disorders. All right, so let's talk about pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is when fluid is in the alveoli, okay? Excess of fluid is in, the, is in the alveoli, okay? If the fluid is there, two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. If fluid is there, air can't be there. So when somebody's lungs is full of fluid, when they try to take a breath, it doesn't do anything because air is not getting in there because fluid is in the way. Okay, this is a cross section of an alveoli, and these are the capillaries, right? Right? This is like a bubble bath, right? It's just full of print frothy secretions. Remember, I told you pulmonary edema is frothy. It's not liquid, liquid, but it's frothy liquid, like the fuzz off of a beer, right? Full in the alveoli. And so, what did I say we treat? What medicine we use to treat pulmonary edema? Is it um, alcohol? Alcohol, good. We use ETOH, also known as vodka. We can use vodka to treat this pulmonary edema. What vodka does is turn this pink frothy secretions into liquid. Okay, it turns the froth to a liquid so we can suck it out. If it's a froth, we can't suck it out because if you try to take a straw on some froth, you're not going to get nothing but air. Okay. So we can't suck that out. We have to turn it into a liquid so that we can remove it, okay? 
So that's why it's called a restrictor because it won't inflate like you want it to because it's full of liquid. All right. Now there's two types of pulmonary edema. You have cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic. Okay. Cardiogenic means the heart is causing the pulmonary edema. And non-cardiogenic means the heart is not causing it. Something else is causing it. Now, let's look at cardiogenic, also known as hydrostatic. Cardiogenic, also known as hydrostatic pulmonary edema, is problems with the left side of the heart, commonly congestive heart failure. Okay, That means the left side of the heart is not pumping like it should. Liquid is, I mean, blood is starting to get backed up. Other pulmonary secretions and fluids are being backed up. And so if it's not going to the body, it's going back to the aorta, back down into the left ventricle and atria, right? And it starts to back up. Once it backs up to the left ventricle, it keeps on backing up into the left atrium and then back to the pulmonary veins. From the pulmonary veins back into the lungs. So the fluid is not getting out through the left ventricle, so it starts to back up, right? And backs back up into the lungs and then now the lungs are filling up with pink frothy secretions, all right? And that's a problem. That's called congestive heart failure. The heart is congested, okay? Congestive heart failure. Also caused by arrhythmias, systemic hypertension, so high blood pressure, congenital heart defects. That means born with different heart defects can cause pulmonary edema. Uh, excessive fluid administration can cause cardiac uh, pulmonary edema. That's you constantly giving uh, those water bottles and we're not watching their intake and output. Nurses constantly giving fluids and not, the patient's not peeing, right? The patient's not removing or excreting any water, but you, the nurses constantly give them IV bag after IV bag of normal saline or fluid. We're giving them all of those large volume nebulizers full of fluid and we're not watching them. We're not watching his intake and output and so now we're giving him too much. That's becoming backing up, right? And now he's getting congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. Mitral valve or aortic valve stent, uh, disease. The mitral valve and the aortic valve are on the left side. Mitral valve is also known as the what valve? The bicuspid, the mitral valve, also known as the bicuspid valve. That's on the left side, right? Aortic valve on the left side. So if those valves are messed up, say you have a mitral valve or aortic valve disease, that can be causing the backup, right? It may, because the blood is supposed to go one direction. But if those valves are messed up, blood might be going both directions, right? And if it's going both directions, it's, it's backing up. We don't want that. We want the blood to go from the left atria through the uh, bicuspid valve or mitral valve into the left ventricle. We don't want it to go backwards, all right? And if that valve is jacked up, then you possibly have blood and fluid going backwards, all right? And if it's going backwards, it's going back to the lungs, all right? And then myocardial infarction, which is a MI, heart attack, okay? Those are some of the cardiogenic reasons for pulmonary edema. Remember, pulmonary edema is either heart or not heart, which is cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Okay, cardiogenic is also known as hydrostatic, and these are the problems here. All right, non-cardiogenic. If I have non-cardiogenic or non-hydrostatic pulmonary edema, that is pulmonary edema that is not caused by the heart. Okay. And these are some of the things it could be. It could be an increased capillary permeability. That means the capillary is permeable. It's, it's too permeable, right? It's supposed to be permeable to uh, gases, right? The capillary should not have fluid coming in and out of it. It should just be the gases. CO2 and oxygen should be the only thing going from the capillary into the alveoli. And alveoli to the capillary should be nothing but gas. But if there's an increased permeability, then now blood and other things are leaking from the capillary into the alveoli, causing fluid in the alveoli. It should be no fluid in that alveoli at all. It should be nothing but gas. Okay. So increased alveolar, I mean increased capillary permeability. This is some of the things that have to do with that. 
alveolar hypoxia, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is ARDS can cause that. Inhalation of toxic agents like chlorine, sulfur dioxide, and stuff like that, ammonia. Breathing stuff like that can make that capillary become more permeable, right? You have to be careful. Pulmonary infections like pneumonia can cause that. Therapeutic radiation. If somebody has a uh, cancer that they have to get radiated, that radiation can cause increased capillary permeability. If that happens, the, the capillaries start to leak more into the alveoli, right? Remember, the capillary lays on top of the alveoli, right? And that's where gas exchange happens. The alveoli gives the capillary oxygen and the capillary gives the uh, alveoli CO2. That's the only thing that should be going back and forth. But if you breathe something in like sulfur dioxide, chlorine, it destroys your capillaries. Uh, uh, infections and radiation, head injuries can destroy the capillary. And now not only is gas exchanging, but also fluids, liquids are going, blood and other things are going in and out of the capillary, and that's filling up inside of your uh, pulmonary, I mean, your alveoli, okay? So if you look at that picture, this right here, these capillaries, look at that. See how they're just pouring into the alveoli? This capillary is just pouring into the alveoli like a bubble bath, right? That should not be happening. There should be nothing but gas going from the capillary into the alveoli, and then gas going from the alveoli into the capillary. That's the only thing should be transferring. Or exchanging, but because the capillary is now permeable, right, either from the, uh, you know, heart issue or the non-heart issue, it should not have fluid going in. Now the fluid is coming from the capillary and pouring into the alveoli. Now it's no room for air, right? There's no room for the air now. That should not be happening, okay? All right. The other reason for non-cardiac pulmonary edema is lymphatic insufficiency. This occurs when uh, normal lymphatic drainage of the lungs is decreased. Uh, the lymphatic insufficiency, whenever you do have a little bit of fluid or something in the alveoli or in the lungs, the lymphatic system is supposed to absorb it, okay? Your lymph nodes and your lymphatic drainage of the lungs is decreased. It should be draining the fluid off the lung into the lymph nodes, okay? But if they're not doing their problem, their job right, then that's another reason why fluid stays in the alveoli or gets into the alveoli because the lymph, the lymph node, the lymphatic system is not sucking it up like it should, all right? And that can happen because of damaged or distorted, this, uh, this distorted lymphatic vessels. If the lymph lymphatic vessels are damaged, they can't suck that water in. Uh, obstruction by tumor cells. They, they're supposed to be sucking water in, but there's a tumor right there. So now it can't suck the little liquid in. That can cause it. Or increased systemic pressures uh, may slow it, it down. Okay, so lymphatic insufficiency. Insufficiency is the second type of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Okay, first one was increased cap capillary permeability, where liquid is going back and forth out of the alveoli and the capillary should not be nothing but gas. Lymphatic insufficiency is the lymphatic vessels also have like a vacuum. They suck up any extra fluid or drainage from the lungs. That should be happening. If, if that, those vessels are damaged, right, or obstructed by tumor cells or the pressures, uh, too, too high pressures in there, then they can't suck the fluid up. And so now uh, that fluid is remaining in the alveoli causing pulmonary edema, okay? And then decreased oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure is a opposing force to hydrostatic pressure. It is the pressure that pulls fluid into the vessels. So those lymphatic vessels that suck it up, they suck it up in a action called oncotic pressure, okay? Oncotic pressure is what allows the lymphatic vessels to suck in that extra fluid. So either, either the vessel ain't working right or it's messed up and it won't suck or can't receive it, or the oncotic pressure is decreased where there is no pressure to make the lymphatic vessel suck it up, okay? Very detailed things, um, but the main thing we need you to know is that pulmonary edema can either be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, okay? 
cardiogenic or cardiac, we call that cardiac pulmonary edema, it's usually CHF. Congestive heart failure or left-sided heart failure can cause cardiac pulmonary edema. But there's also some things that cause pulmonary edema that are not cardiogenic, and that's these things here. Increased capillary permeability, lymphatic insufficiency, and decreased oncotic pressure, okay? How does it manifest? Well, uh, interstitial edema, right? You have uh, interstitial edema, that is fluid in between the cells, right? Interstitial means in between the cells. Alveolar flooding, look at that. That's the alveolar is overfilling with, with fluid. Increased surface tension in the alveolar fluid. So that surface tension is high. So we have to give alcohol to decrease the surface tension so that we can suck it out, right? ETOH is a surface active agent. Those are our surface active agents, ETOH. We get that and that will decrease the surface tension of the fluid in the alveoli, which will allow us then to suction it out. The patient might be doing a lot of coughing. Telltale sign of pulmonary edema is frothy pink secretions. Frothy pink secretions. Frothy pink or white secretions is a telltale sign of pulmonary edema. Okay, you'll see that somewhere. Parasomial uh, nocturnal dyspnea, or orthopnea, somebody who's having trouble breathing at night, or orthopnea, where they have to have a bunch of pillows to sleep. They can't lay flat. Somebody who has orthopnea cannot lay flat without feeling short of breath, okay? And then PFTs, of course, show reduced volumes and capacities, okay? You also have can have increased high, high, uh, hemodynamic pressures. Now right, you're gonna learn hemodynamics when you get to 240. The only pressure you know about now in the heart is the blood pressure, right? That's on the systemic from the heart is blood pressure. But when you get to hemodynamics, you're gonna learn what the pressure is in the right atria. The right atria has a pressure. Uh, the wedge between the ventricle and the uh, between the ventricle and the um, aorta have a pressure, right? Uh, that's the wedge pressure, right? There's pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, PCWP, right? And then there is um, also a pulmonary artery pressure. The pressure inside the pulmonary artery should be a certain pressure, right? Those are your hemodynamics, okay? So that's what gets really interesting. That's when you're in dealing with somebody in critical care when you're in ICU working as a therapist. No therapist in ICU is in there for breathing treatments, right? You have to be in there knowing what's going on hemodynamically with your patient. And because all of those pressures of the heart matter into how you deal or how you uh, give out your therapy for that patient, okay? Especially if they're gonna be on a ventilator, have all kind of numbers on the board, you're gonna have to know what they are, okay? You're gonna have to know what they are. Because for instance, the, the uh, pulmonary, artery pressure. If the pulmonary artery has too much pressure in it, then the blood can't get from the right ventricle into the lungs. So the patient's going to be desatting. No matter what you do, no matter how much oxygen you give them, the blood is barely getting to the lungs because the pulmonary artery is so high. But you got to know what's high, right? I think it's 25 over 8 or something like that is the normal pressure, but it might be super high. So we have to give something that will change that. Like I told you, Viagra. Viagra was first made for pulmonary uh, pulmonary um, hypertension. The tension or the pressure inside the pulmonary artery was high. And so they gave sindifinil, which is the generic form of Viagra, and that dilates the pulmonary artery, which will allow the blood to freely pass into the lungs so the patient can oxygenate. All right? But if that don't work, then we give them nitric oxide, which is a gas that we introduce into the ventilatory system. And it has to be monitored because it can, only, can never go above 20 parts per million. And if you go over that, it becomes nitric oxide, which will kill them, okay? So you have, as a therapist, are the one that's monitoring that. You have to introduce it into the circuit. You have to be monitoring it, making sure the parts per million is not too high. Uh, and you're watching the pulmonary artery pressure go down on the monitor to know how to gauge that. And nitric oxide, I think it's like $1,000 a minute. 
to give nitric oxide. So it's very, very deep. Now, this is real deal respiratory therapy, all right? That gets fun. Like I said, it's in 240 when you get to hemodynamics, all right? Hemodynamics. Now, uh, of course, the chest x-ray. Chest x-ray for pulmonary edema is usually bi bilateral fluffy infiltrates, uh, cardiomegaly, curly A and B lines. You don't have to worry about all of the chest x-ray stuff. You're not into chest x-rays yet. But this is how uh, pulmonary will look. It's just fluffy infiltrate. Just, this looks kind of fluffy, right? I'll show you a couple pictures of pulmonary edema uh, chest x-rays, okay? How do we treat it? Well, we treat it pharma pharmacological. Preload reducers like nitroglycerin, diuretics, morphine sulfate, right? Afterload reducers like catrophil, enopril, and nitroprusside. Basically, it's trying to control the blood pressure. All right, we're trying to control the blood pressure. Uh, might even give into uh, inotropics like uh, dobutamine, dopamine, no epinephrine. Uh, you know, like I said, you don't have to know none of these medicines because we don't, you don't give these medicines. Uh, but we give oxygen bronchial hygiene, right? We probably, we may give that ETOH, right? Uh, we also can do this, lung expansion therapy, which you're gonna learn about tomorrow, hyper, hyper inflation, expand them lungs out to push. Now, when we give positive pressure to a patient with pulmonary edema, what that does is it forces the fluid out of the alveoli into the interstitial space, right? Because that alveoli I showed you in the picture is full of fluid. And you trying to breathe is not helping it. But if I force some air into you, it will push that fluid out into the interstitial space where the diuretic can pick it up, okay? And then they'll pee it out, all right? So positive pressure like the CPAP mask, continuous positive airway pressure. Continuous positive airway pressure, it's a CPAP, right? We can put them on a CPAP or a BiPAP mask to improve uh, the amount of uh, fluid that we can get off of the lung. Okay, so lung expansion therapy, bronchial hygiene, oxygen, put them on a vent if we have to, bronchodilators uh, might be ordered, uh, inhaled alcohol, right, to reduce the surface tension of the frothy secretions, and place the patient in Fowler's position. You don't want them laying flat, make sure he's sitting up, okay? These are the ways we treat pulmonary edema, pulmonary edema. All right. What causes pulmonary edema? All right, well, ARDS. ARDS can cause uh, some pulmonary edema, right? That's acute respiratory distress syndrome. It can happen from a direct injury, right? Like pneumonia, viral, bacterial, fungal, gastric aspiration. I mean, somebody inhaled their own vomit, okay? Somebody who overdosed uh, may, or drunk may, uh, throw up but then inhale it because they're so sedated from drunk being drunk if that vomitus gets into the lung that's called aspiration gastric aspiration that can cause ARDS a lot of people die from ARDS all of your um, coronavirus patients who get sick they get ARDS that's what we're treating we're treating ARDS and pneumonia for them very hard battle a lot of them make it a lot of them don't that's if they're already sick, all right? Toxic inhalation like uh, cocaine, smoke, high concentrations of oxygen can cause high ARDS. Near drowning, or that water and chlorine get down in your lung, that can cause ARDS. Or lung contusion, you break a rib and one of the ribs pop into your lung, that can cause damage or injury to the lung and it can cause acute respiratory distress, okay? ARDS. Uh, indirect injuries, uh, would be stuff like that are non-pulmonary, like sepsis. You got an infection, right? And an infection somewhere else caused this problem. Burn injury. You can get burned and have lung uh, pulmonary edema from just being burned, right? The body just goes into such a a whirlwind from being burned. You can imagine if the body is in a second degree burns all over your body, the body just goes crazy, okay? And that can cause uh, pulmonary disorders multiple traumas like getting shot or stabbed and gets in your lungs of course uh transfusions if you get a transfusion uh, that can cause ARDS right transfusions pancreatitis can lead to ARDS uh female issues 
like abrupt, abruption placenta, amniotic embolism, eclampsia. Those can cause ARDS. And then drug effects, uh, like the stuff you're taking for leukemia. Drugs that they take for leukemia can cause ARDS and sickle cell. Sickle cell crisis can make the patient go into ARDS as well. ARDS is not a joke. That's an emergent situation. A lot of times we have to turn the patient prone and put them on a ventilator while they land on their stomach because it is shown to ventilate them better if they land on their stomach, right? Lungs are real delicate. Uh, it's just a real sick, it's a real, I'd hate to have ARDS. <clears throat> ARDS is definitely something that has to be done in the hospital. You can't sit at home with ARDS, okay? But ARDS can cause pulmonary edema, which is a restrictive disease, okay? All right, they manifest as pathologic structural damages. Don't worry about this manifestation part here, but uh, yeah, it's not, that, it's not that big of a deal on that part, okay? Uh, that's a little deeper than what you are. Clinical data, what am I looking at? What, what are they gonna be exhibiting um, with ARDS, tachypnea, right, which is breathing fast, decreased lung compliance, right, the lung compliance goes down with restrictive diseases, retractions, because they can't breathe, so they sucking in the neck and ribs, they, they're doing retractions, refractory to uh, hypoxemia, refractory hypoxemia means it does not respond to what? Hypoxemia does not respond to what? We talked about this yesterday. I made y'all tell me what it was yesterday. What's refractory mean? Not respond. So hypoxemia, if something's refractory, if refract, what is refractory hypoxemia? Oxygen. Thank you. Hypoxemia that does not respond to oxygen. It's refractory, Hypo refractory hypoxemia. So you're hypoxic and it's not responding to oxygen, okay? ARDS, you're gonna have to give them some PEEP and we're gonna have to breathe them, make the respiratory rate fast and the volume's low. It's all kinds of things we gotta do because it ain't, oxygen just don't fix it, okay? It doesn't fix it, you gotta do other things. Cyanosis, turning blue. Dull percussion note. That means if you tap on their chest, it sounds dull because there's consolidation in there. It's full. All right. Crackles sounding like crackles in there, like like rice krispies when you listen. Okay. Uh, PFT, of course, has the same as all refractive, I mean restrictive diseases, and uh, chest X-ray, diffuse bilateral infiltrates. They call it ground glass. It looks like if you uh drop a, piece, a sheet of glass on the ground and it grind, shatters all around. That's kind of what the x-ray looks like for ARDS. Like grinded up glass. All right, how do we treat ARDS? Oxygen. You're going to give them some oxygen, but you got to keep the FO2 less than 60% because it's, it's refractory. So you don't want to give them too much oxygen, but you do have to give them some oxygen, okay? But we have to use PEEP but you'll learn that a little later, which is a little uh, positive in expiratory pressure. Keeps the alveolar open at all times, okay? And you want to try to wean that FIO2 as much as possible. Put the patient in a prone position. A rotoprone bed is a bed that would turn like a rotisserie chicken. You had a patient on it'll turn but they're on their stomach, and then it'll turn over and they're laying on their back for a little while. And then it'll turn with a patient on it's called a rotoprone bed. That's in some of the ICUs. Rotoprone has been shown to improve mortal mortality. Inhale nitric oxide, what I said earlier. Inhale nitric oxide. All right, lung expansion. Trying to hyper expand that lung because it's, it's, it's shutting down and it's full of fluid, right? Now you do that with PEEP, you do recruitment maneuvers, right? When I say recruiting alveoli, I make a Pop, 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 pop. You want to open some more back up if you can, okay? But you can't do too much because you'll damage the lung. So ARDS is real tricky, guys. It's real tricky. 
All right, mechanical ventilation. Put them on a ventilator. They're definitely going to have to be on a ventilator. But we're going to use small tidal volumes and high respiratory rate. That's what you need to know. ARD at this level, ARDS, small tidal volumes and high respiratory rate because their lungs are so damaged. They're acute res uh, respiratory distress. Those lungs are delicate. You can pop one if you're not careful. So we have to, and they become uh, um, restrictive. So they have a low compliance. And something has a low compliance, that lung is stiff now, right? So you can't put a regular volume in it because you're going to tear it because it's real stiff. So we have to give them low volume but a high rate so that we have a good minute ventilation, all right? Remember, we said minute ventilation is respiratory rate times volume. And we want the patient to have like a 6 to 10 minute ventilation. Well, if I cannot give you the volume that I need to give you, I got to make up that minute ventilation with the rate. If I'm going to give you a less volume, I got to make that up by giving you more rate, okay? Or if I'm going to give you less rate, I got to make it up by giving more volume, right? You got to get the minute ventilation in the normal values, okay? That's why all this stuff coming back to you. All right, uh, permissive hypercapnia. That means we're going to allow you to be a big hypercapnic. We know you are because you got low volumes and all that, so it's permissive. We will allow you to be a little high on the CO2 side for right now, okay? And then sometimes they do the HFOV, which is high frequency oscillator ventilation, which we use on babies. The little baby one where the ventilators, the little chest is doing like that real, real fast, like a hundred breaths per minute, right? Because the, the baby's lungs is real small and frail. You can't put a lot of volume in a baby lung, so you have to ventilate it very fast to make up the difference of the minute ventilation, okay? ARDS is very critical, okay? A patient is critical condition. All right, the next pulmonary disorder is ILD, which is interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease is destruction of the alveoli and adjacent capillary, uh, pulmonary capillaries. Fibrotic thickening of the respiratory bronchial, alveolar ducts and alveoli, right? Chest x-ray shows bilateral retrolanial pattern, irregularly shaped opacities, gran granulomas, cavity formation, all this x-ray stuff you'll learn in 220. Okay, this is x-ray stuff you learn in 220, all right? Don't worry about that. I'm going to ask you what the x-ray look like on ILD. You're not going to have that type of question in 210. All right. Uh, fibrocalcific plaques, bronchospasms, right? Excessive bronchial secretions. They got always got a lot to suck out. Uh, PFTs are the same as any other uh, restrictive disease. Okay. ILD, interstitial lung disease. Now, I'm going to show you. What you need to know about this one the most is that it's coming from your exposures, okay? This is mainly, you get this mainly from your exposures, and here they are. You don't have to memorize them, just know that, you know, okay, that's one of them exposures, right? Uh, interstitial lung disease of known causes, pneumoconosis, uh, from occupational, environmental, and therapeutic exposures. That's how you get ILD. For instance, you get it from asbestos, coal dust, silica, beryllium, right? You can get asbestos, uh, asbestos from working with asbestos, right? Coal dust can cause coal workers pneumoconosis, all right? Coal miners lung or black lung. People that work in West Virginia, West Virginia, uh, and those coal mines, they come out black, nose is black. Just imagine how black them lungs are, okay? So they're breathing that stuff while they're working in mining coal. You can get a coal miner's disease from that, lung interstitial lung disease from that. But they've been doing it all their life. That's all they know. That's all they can do. All right? So that can happen. I'm going to show you a term that I learned in fourth grade before I even knew I was going to be a respiratory therapist. Okay? Interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease. My teacher was showing us, I hope I'm recording. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my teacher was showing us big words when I was younger. 
And this was one of the words he taught us. Now, you know, I might not spell it. Oh my God. Are you still <laughs> That is a coal miner's disease, also known as an interstitial lung disease. That is called numino ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis. Oh numino ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis. That is a coal miner's disease. That is a coal miner's disease. You can look it up later and see it. That is a coal miners disease i learned that word in fourth grade i don't know how much they use it now but that's what i learned in fourth grade before i even knew i was going to be a respiratory therapist my teacher was teaching us big words <laughs> numino ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis that's a coal miners disease okay and so you can see that it sounds the same as, as what you see now. It's, look at this. Coal miners or coal dust causes pneumoconosis, right? Coal miners lung or black lung. Then silica, silicosis, right? Also, uh, beryllium, beryliosis is uh, dust from certain plastics, ceramics, rocket fuel, and x-ray tubes. You can get beryliosis. If you're x-ray tech, if you're not careful, right? Working around rocket fuel or ceramics, you're working in a factory that makes plastics or ceramics. If you're not wearing proper breathing, you can get that on the military or something like that. You can get it, all right? Then there's organic exposures. These right here were inorganic, right? Exposed, particulate dust exposure. Organic material is stuff like farmer's lung from being around a lot of moldy hay or silage, right? Mushroom workers lung, somebody who walk around mushroom compost all the time. You can get farmer's lung from moldy hay. Wood workers lung from being around wood pulp all day long. You work at a lumber yard, you can catch wood workers lung, okay? Bird feeders lung from being around bird droppings and feathers. Who do you think might get that? Somebody that works with a zoo maybe, but more than that, somebody gonna be around more birds and feathers. What about the person who work at the chicken house to get all those good chicken wings and stuff that we get? Oh, yeah, yeah. They bring it to the factory. Yeah. They work with all them chickens just you know, on the conveyor belt. They're killing chickens all day long, bird droppings and stuff all day long, right? That person can definitely get bird feeders long, bird breeders long, right? Bird breeders long, working in the chicken house, okay? Oh, I'm making a job at the chicken house. We're making $14 an hour, you know? Okay. But you might be paying a price. Make sure you weren't an N95 at a job like that. Animal handlers lungs, people who work with rats and gerbils. Chemical workers lungs, <laughs> paints, resin, and plastics. Somebody's a painter working with a lot of resin, right? All right, those are the organic material exposures, right? That's a lot of different lung diseases. You don't, like I say, you don't have to memorize all of these lung diseases. Just know that if I say which type of restrictive disease, would a person who works around bird droppings get? You don't need to know, okay, that's ILD, right? Or a pulmonary restrictive disease, right? That's what's gonna come from that. Uh, medication, what about medication? Medications and illicit drugs can cause interstitial lung disease. Too many antibiotics can cause ILD. Anti-inflammatories like aspirin and mexotrexate can cause ILD. Uh, Cardiovascular agents like amiodarone. We give amiodarone for heart, heart rate that's really, really high. Somebody's heart rate is 200, we're gonna give them amiodarone, try to bring it down, okay? 
illicit drugs like heroin and methadone can cause ILD. Smoking weed, stuff like that can cause interstitial lung disease, guys. Okay? Radiation therapy can cause ILD. Somebody who you know has a lung tumor or something and they're trying to treat it with radiation, that can cause ILD. Uh, and then finally, irritant gases like chlorine, ammonia, ozone, somebody who's welding a lot, Nitro, uh, nitrogen dioxide, uh, phosphogene, whatever that is, uh, using certain dyes. So just these factories, right? If you're working in a factory, you need to know what you're working with, okay? Make sure you know what you're working with because you could possibly work there for 10 years or five years and develop ILD from it, okay? And that's destroying the lungs. It's, we told you lung destruction is irreversible, okay? Irreversible. All right. So what causes ILD? Well, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Uh, no readily identified specific cause. Don't worry about this part. Mm -mm. ILD comes from those exposures, okay? ILD basically for you comes from those exposures, all right? Those different exposures. Treatment, how do we treat uh, our patients with ILD? Corticosteroids, right? Corticosteroids, we know what those are. Oxygen, mechanical ventilation, pulmonary rehab, lung transplant, if it's severe enough. A person who worked in a coal mine for years and years, he might have to get a lung transplant if he has the money for it, okay? He might have to receive a lung transplant. But we're definitely gonna be giving him steroids like Simbacort or Palmacort, right? Asthma cord, stuff like that. I'm giving them oxygen. Had to put them on a vent if we have to. Pulmonary rehab is stuff like hygiene and helping them take breathing exercises to learn how to deal with the issue. That's pulmonary rehab, okay? Um, and then lung transplant if severe enough. Okay, question. Mm -hmm. How long can a lung transplant last? How long can a lung transplant last? I don't know. Not no time if it ain't connected. If you got them, if you got them just out of the chest breathing, I mean, they last for a long time as long as you're getting fluid on the inside. You know, they're still getting connected to your trach and still living. But as soon as you disconnect it from the trach or something, they dead immediately. Unless you are uh, doing a tra lung transplant or something. Yeah, if you're doing a lung transplant or something, they uh, they will get it and put it on ice immediately. So they'll cut you open and remove it from all the sections and then put it on ice and fly it to wherever it's going. And then they'll put it back in your body because it doesn't have a, a beat, right? It's not a heartbeat that's got to kick back in. It's just, it's, just, it's just a device, really. It's really just a, you know what I'm saying? It's just something that's there. Like if you get another arm from somebody, it, you know, it, it, it's just there. And as long as you get it back on the body and put the blood in it, getting the blood flow through it again, it shouldn't start dying because that's the thing it starts to die because of the necrosis right mm -hmm. because of the uh ischemia there's no blood going to it no more right the blood is the life so you take it off you got to ice it so it slows everything the metabolism down so it doesn't require blood and you get it somewhere else and get it back in the body heat it up and then put their blood through it and it should work like it's supposed to but sometimes it can reject but as far as how long i don't i don't know all right manifestations of of uh, pneumonia, of course, will be loss of volume, restrictive disease. Any restrictive disease is going to have a loss of the volume. Inflammation of the alveoli, of course, alveolar consolidation, atelectasis, hyperthermia. Okay, pneumonia, you have two type of uh, uh, pneumonia. You got bacterial and you have viral, right? So hypothermia means hot. If it's greater than 101 degrees Fahrenheit, bacteria. And if it's less than 101, for viral. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out which pneumonia they got, well, sometimes you can look at the temperature. If they have a temp that's greater than 101, it's probably bacterial pneumonia. If they have pneumonia, but the fever is less than 101, low-grade fever, it's probably viral. Okay? They have a cough increased tactile or vocal deformities, dull percussion no, and of course, chest x-ray, which you'll learn when you get to 210, I mean 220, all right?
the causes of pneumonia. Now, what can cause us to have pneumonia? Uh, uh, bacterial, viral, or fungus, right? Could be any one of those can cause pneumonia. But the most common one is the community acquired pneumonia, CAP, called a CAP, community acquired, something you got from outside the hospital, okay? Uh, it's Streptococcus pneumoniae is about 80% of those. And then uh, staphylococcal pneumoniae uh, often follows a viral infection, usually in children, right? And then influenza, A and B, is the most, oh, it's most common cause of viral pneumonia, okay? So the most common cause of viral pneumonia is, is the flu, all right? And the most commonly acquired um, regular pneumonia is from the community, okay? Then you can get pneumonia from the hospital, called a HAP, or a, a hospital-acquired pneumonia, okay? Also known as nosocomial pneumonia, right? Anytime it's hospital-acquired, it's nosocomial. That's caused by the hospital environment, right? What if they get the ventilator, get the pneumonia after they were on a ventilator? That's called a VAP, ventilator acquired pneumonia. Okay, so it's just common. I mean, you know, just put the two things together. The CAP is a community required acquired pneumonia, right? Um, the uh, HAP is a hospital acquired pneumonia. A VAP is a ventilator acquired pneumonia, and that usually happens 48 hours to two to three days after you've been put intubated okay so they didn't have pneumonia but then you intubated the patient and three days later they got pneumonia they, they got it from the ventilator okay because you have to be careful because once you intubate somebody you now have those oral secretions that are falling down into the throat but there there should be this um this uh balloon on a on et tube is a long tube that goes in the mouth into the trachea but it also has a balloon on it okay it also has a balloon so you disinflate it, the oral secretions fall on the balloon and they don't get into the throat. But a lot of times, you know, people let the, the cuff down or they moving around and those oral secretions start to drain into the lung. That's how they get that pneumonia because your, your mouth secretions are very nasty. Okay, oral secretions and oral bacteria is worse than your behind. Okay, uh, it's very nasty. So if that stuff starts dripping down into the lung, that's how they get sick. Okay, so that's why we want to have him intubated for the least amount of time. We want to intubate him for no more than a week. If he can't get off that vent in a week, we need a trach. Okay, because if not, he's going to get oral secretion down into his lung, causing a ventilator assisted pneumonia or and, um, a ventilator acquired pneumonia, and it can kill him. Okay, um, so with that patient, we want to make keep the head of the bed up, change the circuit when it's soil, uh, suction when indicated change the inline nebulizer every use and appropriate oral care keep that mouth clean we have special products for mouth care little sponges with uh soap on them uh toothpaste tasty little toothpaste because they can't eat or drink for a long time so you give them a little something like that brush their teeth and suck it it has a suction to it or you don't let it go down the throat but you can scrub that mouth real good and those teeth and those lips because they get crusty and nasty uh if you don't take care of it okay so make sure you're taking care of your patient's oral care. All right, aspiration pneumonia, we talked about that when you get um, gastric fluids into the lungs. Uh, necrotizing pneumonia from local localized pus formation and necrosis uh, within the pulmonary parenchyma. So it's just, it's just nastiness, right? Uh, pneumonia, you don't have to know all these different types of pneumonia. Just know that pneumonia is a pulmonary category of restrictive disease. Right, you have ARDS, you have pneumonia. Okay, uh, we talked about pulmonary edema first, then we talked about ARDS. Now we're talking about pneumonia. All three of those are the pulmonary restrictive diseases. Okay, those are three of the pulmonary restrictive diseases. How do we treat pneumonia with oxygen, lung expansion therapy, bronchial hygiene? Store in some pieces if we have to. If the lungs are so full, we can stick a needle in the lung and suck some of that stuff out. Okay? We can do that if we have. That's a thorin synthesis. Just like a paracentesis is when you stick a needle in the abdominal to get that ascites out, right? Well, if the lungs is filling up, we can get a thorin synthesis and drain some of the fluid off of the lungs ourselves. Okay? Antibiotics when appropriate, and then prevention. 
for at-risk patients, homeless patients, the patients who are, are very poor. You gotta try to keep them keep clean. Be careful what you're around, all the smoking and wash your hands because those type of things lead to infection, just being nasty, period, okay? And then finally, the restricted lung. I put a, a picture of a restricted lung here. One side, this is the normal lung over here, and this is the restricted. See how it's smaller, right? It's smaller because you can't get the air in. Restricted lungs have decreased spirometry, a decreased IRV, decreased tidal volume, decreased ERV, decreased FRC, decreased uh, inspiratory capacity, decreased vital capacity, and a decreased total lung capacity, right? Because it can't get the air in, so the volumes that are there are low, okay? You can't take a deep breath, so the, the volumes that are there are very low, okay? If the obstructed lung, you have higher FRCs because you can't get the air out, right? And so this is a picture of the restricted lung spirometry, all right? All your restrictive lung diseases share the same spirometry, whether it's skeletal, abdominal, neuromuscular, or pulmonary. All of them have the same type of spirometry results, okay? All right, make sure you go back today and go over this lecture, go over this PowerPoint that will go over the restrictive diseases. Also look at your, uh, obstructive diseases that we covered. So make sure you know the difference between the two because the test may throw one of them in. We just learned today that uh, interstitial lung disease can happen from exposure, right? Like working with birds or something like that. So if I have a question that says, which disease can happen or can I get from uh, working with birds or being exposed to bird droppings, right? I might have interstitial lung disease, and then I might have chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is a obstructive disease. Interstitial lung disease is the one that we just learned for that, right? So if you didn't know that, you might say, oh, chronic bronchitis. That's totally not even in the right category, right? We're talking about uh, the bird feeders and bird droppings. Those are restrictive lung disease, right? ARDS, restrictive lung disease. Uh, pectus excavatum, right? When you dig somebody's chest out. That's a restriction, right? So don't pick a obstructive lung disease for a restrictive question. But the only way you're gonna not do that is if you study the other one and this one tonight. Go over this one again tonight and look at the obstructive again, okay? Tomorrow we're gonna do uh, hyperinflation and the indications and kind of indications for hyperinflation. How do we pop those lungs open for those who are sedated or who just came out of surgery, right? Uh, because we don't want them to develop atelectasis, right? We don't want that to happen because we know that atelectasis can lead to a lot of different things. So uh, we want to prevent that or treat that with hyperinflation. We can either do positive pressure hyperinflation where we're forcing air in or we allow the patient or teach them how to do it themselves, which is negative. Because when you negative suck, that's the natural way. The natural way to inhale is through negative means, right? Becoming more negative than outside. So the air goes in, okay? And so we're going to learn that tomorrow. And then we're going to kind of cumulate those things, answer a couple of questions about all of those. So be prepared to answer quiz type questions tomorrow on obstructive and restrictive tomorrow, okay? Um, uh, you did the... Um, comprehensive work last night if you could get to it because for some reason it was locked i'm not going to count it against you if you weren't able to get it everybody gets credit for that to, for, for today or for yesterday today uh, your homework is to study okay today your homework is to study start studying the two that you've learned start going back to your blast from the past because i've asked a lot of questions today about older stuff that you it just totally lost your mind like serous fluid. I said, where is serous fluid supposed to be? You supposed to already, you got to know that. That's in between the plural, right? So I asked you what the normal calcium is, what the normal potassium is. You got to have those things in your mind. That stuff's coming back in the oral exam and the final, okay? So you can't just not look at that stuff. You have to lock it down, especially these last week of school, okay? It's almost over. You're going to go into the Christmas break. It'd be good to go into the Christmas break knowing that you, uh, or going to 220.
okay? So let's get this together. Go back to your all of your sections, your aerosol humidity, gas, the tanks, all that kind of stuff, qualities of oxygen. You got to know all of that stuff for the oral and the final. So tomorrow we're going to do hyperinflation, and then I may do some oral exam practice, okay? So if you want, what's tomorrow? Thursday. Tomorrow is Thursday. It's at home, okay? Online only tomorrow for Thursday. So I'm probably going to do um, get those things done. And matter of fact, uh, I might, what's, what's my Friday after that, right? Thursday, Friday. Okay, I'll be here Friday. Uh, we may have a, a, a review of all of this on Friday, practice some orals, stuff like that. Uh, who has the, the syllabus? So do you know when it says the test is? Friday. Test supposed to be Friday? Okay. Uh, I might give the test on Monday, all right? Uh, because I want to uh, uh, go over um, review for orals, okay? I want to get, I got to get some of that done, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm, you, can, you can come on Friday if you want, you know, you don't have to, but I'll be here Friday. It's better the more people that are here so that we can go over. Is it lab Friday too? Okay. So like I said, we're going to learn, and it might be, it might be, I have to look. Let me look and see. Be on the safe side. All right, so the syllabus is here. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see it too. All right. We're all the way down here at hyperinflation, okay? Yeah, hyperinflation today is what? The, the second, okay. Thursday, we'll, okay, so Thursday we are going to, yeah, it is lab day. So we're going to do, Thursday we're going to do uh, the hyperinflation lab, uh, not lab, I'm sorry, hyperinflation lecture. Hyperinflation lecture on tomorrow, okay, that's it. And it's not really that long. It's a PowerPoint just like this but it's not really that long. Friday, when you come to class, we're gonna have the uh, lab for this lesson, which is the use of the metonym. We're gonna learn more about that tomorrow during the lecture uh, and the incentive spirometer, right? How to breathe, you know, I'm gonna give everybody an incentive spirometer, stuff like that, easy lab, okay? Easy lab. Now, I wanna, I'm gonna do the lab and review that day, okay? Lab and review that day. And then we're going to take the test on Monday and do any makeup labs that need to be done, okay? So Friday is going to be uh, the lab for this section here, and I'm going to do some practice, some review stuff like the oral. So everybody will be here, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to pull out some oral cards, and it'll be from everything from start to finish because you've learned everything. By Friday, you will have known everything, okay? That's the it. This is it. Tomorrow is the last thing I can tell you on 210. CPR is not on the oral, okay? So uh, Friday, you're going to get practice with oral. So everybody will be here. I'm going to pull oral cards. Just ask you, ask you. And you can keep a record of how many you got right and how many you didn't, okay? So we're going to do the lab, which is quick, and then we're going to do practice orals for the rest of that day, okay? And then Monday, we're going to come in and take the exam for two, 210J and any kind of makeup lab. So if you need to make up a lab, you need to be here and be ready to do that Monday after the exam, okay? Now, that means you need to let me know ahead of time which lab you prepare to do because I can't do 100 different labs in one day, okay? Or you can, well, I think I got to do this one. I think, no. If you know which one you need, say, Mr. Proctor, I need the tank lab for Monday or whatever. That way I can be prepared and have the stuff out that you need. And Mr. McCarthy, I want to be here at 8 or do I want to be here at one to four for the lab, okay? Because the test gonna be at eight, right? The test will be Monday at 8 a.m., okay? And if you want to take, if you have a makeup lab and you want to take the test and leave, right? That's on you, but we will be doing uh, lab makeups on that day, right? So I, from after the test, if you've done, you don't have any labs to do, you can go, okay? You're done for Monday, all right? If you have a lab to make up, but you need to make it up at one, 
you want to come and take the test at eight and then come back at one to take your lab, that's fine. But whatever, you need to let me know because I'm not going to be sitting here looking crazy and nobody show up because I'll go home. Okay. So, and plus Monday is my day to be off anyway. But since it's allowed, we can be here. Okay. We will be here Monday, even though Monday is one of my days to be home. We will be here that Monday because we have a lab. Okay. That, that supersedes that, that, that right there. Okay. So everybody understand what we're doing uh, Friday. Friday will be the lab for this section and oral review. So on Monday, the, the test. That's it. That's it. Lecture. No lecture. No lecture on Monday. Monday is simply going to be test and makeup lab. Okay? Test and makeup lab. So we're going to test and makeup lab that day. All right, right here. All right. All right, so test and makeup lab on Monday the 7th. All right, so right here, we're going to do, get rid of this right here. We're going to do lab on Friday and oral practice. Okay, oral practice and lab that day. And then on Monday, RT 210J exam. All right. Now, that's what we're going to do. Now, look, let's see what we got coming up after that. Tuesday is also supposed to be a makeup uh, lab day. Okay. Tuesday the 8th is also a makeup lab day. If you need to make up a lab and you want to make it up on that Tuesday, that's fine. If you don't want to make it up Monday, you want to make it up Tuesday, you need to let me know. Because if I have nobody that's going to make up nothing, then after the test, I'm going home. Okay? But if you say, I want to come uh, at, 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 uh, on Monday at, at 1 or Monday at 8, you know, after the test to do my lab, or I want to come Tuesday to make up my lab, that's fine. All right? Uh, Wednesday, we'll start also practicing for oral and review. Right, we're gonna start practicing oral and review. All right, and then uh, on Wednesday, oral and review, practice games, whatever we got to do to help you practice for the final and the, and the oral. All right, uh, Thursday is oral and final. Right, practice is just review. After after that, after this next test, it's just reviewing, getting ready. Now. Friday, December 11th is your oral exam, whether it's going to be on campus or online. I'm not sure. I'm going to find that out today. Okay, I will find that out today and let you know for sure what he says, because he will probably send you an email with a drop down. Okay, it's going to be a Microsoft drop down. When you open it up, there's going to be a little drop box with your name. You drop it, you pick your name and pick your time, right? That's how we have been doing it. So then you log into and a module will be added to my modules for oral, okay? And so it may say 8 o'clock, uh, Cummins and Rivers, right? So at 8 o'clock, you know, you need to click that Zoom link, okay? And it, you're going to be directed to whatever person going to be doing your orals. That's how we've been doing it, but I, I got a feeling we're going to be on campus this time, uh, which it makes it so much easier, okay? Uh, you just come on campus, and usually we'll be, everybody will be in here practicing and still reviewing, and then the instructors will come and pull you out of here and go, like two or three people will go over there with two or three instructors separated, and you'll do your oral like that, then you'll come back over here, tell me your score, I'll put it in, okay? That's probably how it's going to happen. But Friday is the oral, and then Monday is the, which is the 14th, I don't know why that should have been the 14th. Yeah, Monday the 14th is the final exam. Okay. After that, you start going into your CPR stuff. That third, that Tuesday, you need to do those CPR lessons I showed you on that other uh, lecture where you do your BLS one, two, and three, and then take the test. Okay. And then after that, we're going to come in on Thursday the 18th to do your CPR dress check off. Everybody got to come so you can do your compressions and your bagging and Hey, hey, you okay? Check and pause. Check and for breathing. Get 911, get the AED stack. Being able to put the AED on. All that's going to come from the video. Okay? 
So don't come in here talking about well, where that what's an AAV? That's you're gonna get sent home. This is that's the last little bit. You can a lot of people like to sleep on that because I'm done now. But this will fail you. Okay, not doing this CPR will fail you. Period. So make sure you look at the video. Of course, we're not gonna say what you do it. You know, we're gonna go through a few things and help you out a little minimal instruction. Right, minimal instruction because if you watch the video and answer the questions along with the video and take the test, you should be prepared for the checkout. Okay, no, with no problem. All right, so 18th that Thursday will be the CPR checkoffs. You'll probably go home and be done. Friday is clinical orientation, and that's if she comes to talk to y'all. She might, she might not. So 18th may be the last day. Okay, maybe your last day. So that is the rundown. Coming up, you're almost done. Tomorrow we're gonna do uh, continue on with the uh, uh, hyperinflation, uh, and then Friday, which is at home. Don't forget, tomorrow's from home only. Uh, then Friday will be the come up to the campus to do your lab and our practice our orals. Monday, take the test. Right, you got the weekend to study all that. Take the test on Monday. And if you want to make up any labs, you can make them up on Monday or Tuesday. You need to email me and let me know what day, Monday or Tuesday, and which time, 8 or 1, that you want to make up which lab, okay? So I can help you. We're not going to be here all day trying to figure out what you need and all that. It's on you to know what you need, not me. Don't you need to make up a lab after the test? No, you can email me today, tomorrow. It don't matter. Just let me no, know. Yeah, you need to let me. Yeah, because I I need to know what it is. You know, I I want I want I don't want to be digging through trying to find. If you if I know I got two people need to do tanks on that day, then I have the tanks out. You know, what I'm saying prepare so you can take your test, do your lab, and get on down. All right, all right. So that's it, guys. Have a good day. Uh, like I said, tonight's homework will simply be study. Everybody will get uh credit for being here today. Uh, so you need to just study. Okay, we at the end of it now. Uh, if you haven't been coming, then, you know, it's not going to matter anyway. All right. Now, one last thing. If you fail the final, then you won't even have to do the CPR stuff. If you fail the final and fail the class. Now, some, some people can fail the final and still pass. All right. But if you fail the course, you take the final and you see that you're not going to pass the course, even with the CPR grade. Right. Even if you get 100 on CPR and you see that I ain't going to pass even with 100 on CPR then that means you don't have to do come for the CPR and do all that because you're going to do it again next time anyway, right? It's, it's really pointless because no matter if you take it or not, you still want to fail the class, okay? So that's why we leave CPR down a little further, but that way, you know, we got students that take the final and don't pass the final and don't pass the class, then why? They don't need to make them no labs. They don't need to come take no CPR, none of that because you didn't pass, okay? I'll have to see you on the next monday okay just start it over again like i said 210 and 230 are the ones that people fail the most so you're not alone if you don't pass 210 or 230 you along with the with the majority of students that fail any of them fail these two okay because this is so much at the you never heard of respiratory and here it is so some people make it through some people don't depending on uh, the situations at home and being able to get here and, and, and or it might be too much information, right? It ain't for everybody, right? We'll tell you that now. It's not for everybody. If it was for everybody, we wouldn't be making the money we make. That's just being real, okay? All right, but we're going to give you every tool that we can give you. It's on you to make it, okay? Y'all have a good day. I will see you tomorrow from home uh, for the rest of the, the remainder of the lecture. Have a good day.